Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hi, everyone. Hello, Aida. Hello, Michelle. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. So let's see how many questions we can go through today. I think we're getting better every time, right? I think so too. (laughs) We're we're improving. Focus. Focus. Yes, yes, yes. Somebody came through as duplicates, I saw. So um, we'll just we'll just combine them together. I see the same name pop up, and it's almost very similar questions. So we'll condense. Okay. And if we read hi. your question out, guys, and uh, post in the chat, say hi. Don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> cool. Shall we begin? Here we go. <clears throat> All, right. All right. I just said I showed them the three pages. Let's see how many we can get through. Okay. Shall I'll I'll start for you. Okay. Uh, I have recently been diagnosed. Is that the same one as you? Yes. Yes, that's the okay. same one. I have recently been diagnosed with parox. Optimal AFib, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, um, and put on medication to help, and put on medication to help. Been told I'm safe, but every time my heart does something a little odd or a misbeat, I get a wave of panic and I'm so anxious just waiting for the next attack. How can I control? I love this one. How can I control my automatic response to this? It's literally ruining every day I have. So Mm -hmm. just to summarize that question somebody actually was given a medical diagnosis which people have health conditions right they're being Mm -hmm. seen by a doctor so they have an actual health condition happening and they're having anxiety about an actual health condition that's occurring um so that's the the gist of that question um anybody in the chat could relate to that question or actually submitted that question if you want to chat along with us Yes. Yes. I think everybody has gone through something similar at some point or will go through something at some point in their lives. And I just want to point out um, Carol, who asked the question, it is so normal to have that that reaction, right? Now, there is a real health scare. So your nervous system will be on high alert and your anxious mind will check in because there's actually really something happening, right? So this is First of all, not something we have control over. And secondly, a very normal response. You know, the disordered part, or it can turn into a disordered part, is something that, that restricts the quality of your life when you feel that it's excessive and it doesn't stop. Right. Um, but even there, it's not the checking in itself that is the problem, but your evaluation of checking in and then the urge to control. The urge to control. Your doctor told you you are fine, but your anxious mind is like, what if you are not fine? Mm -hmm. And if you're not fine, you are the one who can take care of this. So do something. Here is some energy. This is what you notice in the form of the adrenaline zap that is supposed to make you now act. But since you don't really know if there is a danger or not, there is nothing that you can actually do. All you're left with is reassurance behavior. And that can come in form of constantly checking in or, you know, slowing down your movements, maybe not exercising anymore or constantly comparing your experience with other people's. This is how you try to, to, to regain control over that perceived sense of a uh, perceived sense of lost control. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I hope it makes sense. But you're trying to re kind of like reestablish order. And that is what keeps you stuck in this. You cannot control your autonomic nervous system or your initial response that does this. Oh my God, my heart just skipped a beat. You can't control it. It will happen. So try to let that go. This is what we also call first fear or flash fear. What is it called in the book? Uh, I was just, you were, I was planning what I'm saying as you're saying it. I'm like, you know, Claire Weeks, if whoever reads has read Claire Weeks, she calls it. First fear and second fear. And second Henry fear. Yeah. Flash fear, response fear. You'll hear me say reaction, yeah. response. Why we don't all say the same damn thing? I don't know because we all like to be fancy. Yeah. But like, <laughs> I, I just say reaction because your body, like this is the perfect line that with most of everybody's questions are around. How can I control my automatic response? 
that in itself, it's like, I've decided I don't like if the doctor's checking your reflexes by hitting your knee and you get frustrated or annoyed that your leg still pops up. You don't get to decide that part. You can't control your auto. That's why it's the autonomic nervous system. It was never our job. Those things were not our job. They don't need our prefrontal cortexing involvement, right? Like they don't need us consciously doing things. And we think I need to do something to change this. And that's where it goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It's okay. So I thought there was something wrong with my heart. I had a heart. I had a health concern. And it looks like there was something that was of concern, but that's now been basically resolved being treated with medication. And the doctor has said, the concern is no longer a concern. Well, your alarm has not gotten that message yet. So now your alarm, now notice your alarm's not ringing every time you have a sore ankle. It's ringing every time this, if you're on the podcast, went into my chest, right? You're every time your heart does something different, it's sending you energy to do something. And Aida said all the rest perfectly. I don't have anything else really to add to that. It's just, it's an, it's become like your alarm. It's become like your alarm's condition response. Like we talk yes. about condition yes. response, right? Your alarm develops its own condition response of every time her, this body part does X, Y, Z, we are going to whoosh, send her energy. But then you're getting frustrated that I can't stop my body from sending the energy. So how does that mm. happen? It happens backwards. I have to allow the process of my body sending me energy to show this alarm what I do with that energy. Do I fight my heart or do I fight the energy or do I just, this is, this is what we talk about all the time. Be still with that energy, leave my heart, acknowledge what's present, embrace discomfort. Thank you to the alarm system and your autonomic system takes care of itself. This is not a direct approach. Um, So again, it's literally ruining every day I have because you have an expectation attached to this whoosh. And now you've labeled. So your alarm has labeled the heart as danger. And now you have labeled the alarm as danger. And now your alarm's ringing all the time. Yes. And also keep in mind everything that revolves around our heart or our lungs or our sanity, right? This is where we get to get a, a lot of anxiety because stakes are really high, right? If something happens to my heart, I'm going to drop dead. So it's very normal that we're more sensitized when, when something comes up, you know, that, that scares us, that has to do with these very vital organs. And also, you know, we are used to not hearing or noticing our heart or our lungs, same mm-hmm. as we don't notice our liver or our kidneys. A spleen. I always say spleen. I don't <laughs> know where spleen. the heck that is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're still doing its, its job like all the time. But when we focus on them, this is where we, 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 we zoom in and then we're like, oh, I noticed this and now I noticed the change. And what was that? And what was that sound? And why does this feel different? No, it, it I assume it has always felt like this, but you weren't so zoomed in. So just Mm -hmm. take that into account just to give your experience a little bit more context. It's okay to be afraid. It's absolutely all right to be anxious, to be concerned and worried. It is a thing. It's a health scare. You should be scared, but scared at some point needs to stop when scared is no longer needed and you have reached that point. And now it's about riding out that wave, okay, of anxiety that has already built up and just, you know, sitting it out. It will regulate itself. Mm-hmm. Self-regulating. It yeah. System. <laughs> so important. So, I'm so sure important. that point enough, which is the opposite of what everybody else is screaming out there on social media. We are not, yeah. we are, we are trying to scream louder, but we'll just say it softly now. Your body yes. is itself. Regulating, regulating system. system it takes care of itself while you take care of life and that's how you work together yes all cool. right um so next question looks like she submitted a similar question twice so oh okay See? so yeah. okay outside of the operating room today i backed out of a cataract surgery I was handling the anxiety and wishes just fine, but then nearly 12 hours of fasting caught up with me. I needed I needed to eat right now. I was 
feeding and going under the minute, I got food into the. I'm sorry, there is. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a little bit mixed up. How it yeah, I was ready for the surgery again, but of course they wouldn't do it. I'm rescheduling for a much earlier morning starting time. I have the sense I failed in my dare. I'm quite confident without the hunger induced weakness, I would have been able to have gone on with the surgery. How can I handle this better next time? So to, just to sum this up and, and to make it more clear, uh, this person has had a cataract surgery scheduled, um, but the, the time of the surgery was 12. 12. Like so the next question was it was 1230, but once, they were fasting oh, okay. for so long they just felt so lightheaded and nauseous and you know how are you feeling you don't eat for 12 hours yes yes and then this person got really anxious and then rescheduled the surgery and now feels like they have failed or didn't you know like failed dare failed themselves uh while they're very sure that without the hunger induced weakness it could have gone differently how can i handle this better next time this person asks I, I would, think you answered your own question, right? <laughs> my my yeah. simple response would be to leave the part that you failed out. Mm -hmm. That's the problematic part. You didn't fail anything. But when you decide I failed is really the problematic part. So like somebody else who doesn't have all this pressure on themselves or like I did it right or I failed. I dared right or I failed. Notice the perfection. Notice the black and white thinking. I mean... Just take another version of that story. Wow, I am not good with 12 hours on a fast. 12.30 seems a little too late. All right, I freaked out a little bit and I left. So next time, I'm going to just cancel. I'm going to uh, have my appointments in the morning because I seem to do best when I go in the morning. Period. Yeah. The end. That kind of ties into our self-compassion webinar we did um, a couple of episodes ago. If you guys you guys find that relatable, take a listen to that one from, I don't know, three or four um, webinars ago, but it's like, so what? Who cares, right? It's the, okay, yeah, well, that didn't work out so well. Now what? Let's make an adjustment. All right, we'll go in the morning. That's not even necessarily dare. That's just kind of being a little kinder to yourself as you, you know, work through life of what's most helpful to you and, and what's not as helpful. Yeah, I love that. Right? And you can take a break. You can take a break. When I have to go on the MRI scan, ugh, like I hate it. I will press that button once or twice. Like I need a break. <laughs> okay, I need a breather. Okay, now, okay, you can you can get me back in. But Or when you drive, people with driving anxiety, who says you have to drive through the whole you know, route? You can stop, take a break, breathe through the anxiety, and then move on. That's totally fine. And if something... Like the circumstances are just making it really hard for you to succeed today. Fine, pick another day where the circumstances are a little bit easier. You know, and I think you having anxiety and having to fast for 12 hours was an issue. But guess what? I bet that many people who don't have an issue with anxiety have a problem with 12 hour fasting. Mm -hmm. right? So it's uncomfortable for that too. It's just, you know, uh, um, discomfort added onto already built up discomfort. You're not a failure. Nothing went wrong. You did perfectly fine. And you have answered your own question, by the way. So next time, I'm just going to try to make the circumstances um, a bit more favorable to me. Great. And, and you mm -hmm. use dare for that, too. When I didn't do it just... Okay, so you didn't do the surgery. At dare is, how do I treat that? Now you turned it inward and beat yourself up. And so we would say, okay. I accept the fact that I didn't take do my surgery today. Accept that too. Like that's part yeah. of accepting and allowing. Accept the fact that that I decided to not do that and I'm making my decisions willingly. Like period. Try, start putting periods at the end of things. Because otherwise it's, look what this thing I didn't do and now I'm ruminating and perseverating and beating myself and it means a sign of failure. It really doesn't. It really does not. So notice your story about that experience. Yeah. Why would we like expect perfection? from us that means like we are you know thinking that we are supernatural or super great or super good at the same time we expect perfection which means that we are fantastic at the same time we're telling ourselves what a failure we are and how horrible and how incapable we are like who are we to expect perfection from us we don't expect it from other people whom we deem to be much more competent than ourselves mm -hmm. and we don't expect it from them but us, we, we think we're incompetent and, and can't do shit, right? But at the same time, expect perfection. Right? That's weird.
Okay, next question. Uh, your turn, Michelle. Okay, I have been full blown allowing for the last 16 days, no coping methods or compulsion. It felt great not to obsess anymore about every feeling and every thought. Now, now I have random DPDR symptoms testing me, um, be- testing me bad, making me want to go back to coping and compulsion. Any tips on how to trust the acceptance? even with scary DPDR symptoms. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> there, there's so, so many things I love about this question. I've never heard the term, I have been full-blown allowing. Congratulations. That's fantastic. And also congratulations that you, you got to experience that the obsession falls away, right? When you don't engage in, in these compulsions. So well done. Now something new came up, DPDR. That scared you. Now your alarm is ringing again. And as we have pointed out so many times, but it's this pattern. Notice the pattern. Mm -hmm. Trigger can be anything, a memory, a sensation, a trip, number one. Number two, some worst case scenario attached to it. You're going to cause a massive crash. You are going to lose your mind. You will never be normal again. Step number three, there is your body giving you energy to prevent that or to control that in Mm -hmm. some way. But since there is nothing to control, right? The number four, there you are. Oh, he's here. I don't know. Oh, hi, (laughs) Louis. (laughs) Good you're here. Uh, Number four, there you are feeling anxious, feeling activated, having the urge to do something, right? And can't do anything. The only thing left to do is introspection. Or reassurance, introspection, reassurance. How to trust that? Guess what? Don't wait for trust. Trust is something that 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 comes from experience. And you already know now from dealing with these other sensations that, oh, I can do that, okay? So there is some trust you have built. You can rely on that. But if you can't trust that the DPDR is safe, then choose to have faith. Choose yeah. to have faith if trust is not there yet. And that is all that you need. And you you know from experience that what you have done the past weeks has worked. So trust that and oh, just let yeah. it go. Sorry. Just one last thing. No matter how intense the urge to do something about it feels, no matter how good it feels or how relieving it feels, it never lasts ever. And it just drags you further down a spiral. And you know that from experience too, right? So it's like standing at a crossroads every time you feel like, I want to reassure, I want to reassure. Just stop just for a moment and reflect, oh, how did did this go? (laughs) The past 16 times that I did that. (laughs) Oh, not so well. Okay. (laughs) It's not going to change today. (laughs) Yeah. And instead of even trust, like I would say, treat. How do I treat this thing? So again, it's this guy only cares about survival. And you always see uh, the three pieces. What are the three pieces, guys? Remember, I know if, if you're hearing this on the podcast, you won't see me unless it's up, you see it on the YouTube channel. But there's you, here's my body. This, this maybe was green before when it was something else, whatever thought. And now it's replaced to this black. This is just DPDR. This is the next thing I don't like showed up. This is my alarm screaming, sending me energy to do something about the next thing I don't like. You here, I I ran out of hand. This is the deciding factor. Fight feels fear with this. Release allows the glue to break. Okay. So it's how do I trust, even in here, how do I trust the acceptance? What do you mean trust the acceptance? Trust what? Trust that you're safe. Trust that it'll work. Trust that it'll go away. That's subtle, but Lewis, I'm guessing it's because you're trying to make sure it works and I feel better and get rid of this. And all of this is to, he doesn't care about trust, this guy. He cares about safety. He's showing you, again, tell a boring story, boring story, not. I love that. I love that. I love that being so untethered yeah. from my body and floating. No, I feel weird right now. Things look weird right now. Wow, my head feels weird. Notice the I thing. I need to take take a note of that. I'm going to write a daily dare in your name. Tell a boring story. <laughs> I love it. You know, I'm it's not so writing it. <laughs> <laughs> That was one of our. I'm going to take the, we did take the credit like for that it. <laughs> on 
on Dare Advance, we had anybody here on Dare Advance? Um, we did a whole um, thing on how to tell like a storytelling where somebody brought in something very valuable and meaningful to their hearts. And another thing was a piece of garbage they found around their house. And I said, we're going to work on storytelling. So everybody pick up the thing that you really want to share about. It was very, so somebody held a locket, somebody held a photo Said, okay, now you're going to tell a really super detailed story about the garbage you found on the floor and a boring story about the thing you really want to talk about. And uh, th th right away, the comment was, come on, Michelle. But it's learning how to like, again, it's, oh, but this feeling, but I need to tell you all about DPDR and how awful it feels and what it reminds me of. And that's just further involvement. And when it's, oh, I feel weird right now. Oh my, yeah, my heart's doing a weird thing. Or, oh, I feel, I don't know, I, my stomach feels sick right? We tend to not tell boring stories. We tend to tell very detailed, vivid, pull you into my world stories. And we want to work on storytelling as well. So I have DPDR and my alarm set me fear for it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. The compulsion, the doing is the stuff I'm doing stuff about this thing. And it's just, unless this thing is snakes, unless you're feeling weird and they're snakes, fight the snakes while you still feel weird. You don't fight feel weird. You just feel weird. You feel DPDR. You don't fight it. You don't struggle with it. You experience it. Anything beyond that is the disordered piece. I know what just comes to mind, Michelle. I had a client who, when when uh, he first came to me, was really, you know, deep down in, in DPDR. And I remember on the first call, he was telling me, every detail of, of how it feels and you know how I could imagine how this might feel in his mm -hmm. case and it sounded really like a, a script of a horror movie yeah, yeah but the funny thing about this was that at the end after he finished the story he said something that we both laughed so hard he said I just made this shit much worse didn't I <laughs> Yeah, the violin, <laughs> the smoke laughed. machine, the colorful yeah. language, the description. And so like, I'll tell people too, we get like, um, I get a lot of people that get stuck in that part, creative brains, writers, artists, not because mm. that's prone to anxiety, but because we're very good at like, we see the world in a million shades of all the different colors. And we have a descriptive uh, language ability to kind of pull you into my story. Um, also get a lot of lawyers and salespeople because they're very good at selling their side and why this is really important. And no, 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 yeah, not this, but let me tell you why you want to buy this thing. Let me tell you why he's in it <laughs> or whatever, where it's just people it. that are really good at those jobs for that ability. But that ability mm -hmm. works against us when the focus is on what we're trying to get rid of when our job is to teach you how to let things be not how to get rid of. Yes, you're so right, Michelle. That was a perfect description because I actually, I enjoyed the story because it was so well, like, narrated. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. really beautiful. And I was like, like totally into it. And I could really feel what he was feeling when th that, that he himself then realized, oh, like, I am making this so much harder for myself if I dive into that story so deep. And it was, it was really beautiful sessions because just by realizing that he, he got to change it. And that was immensely helpful. And it ties in so beautifully to what you just said. And you just gave the perfect title to this hella boring story. Guys, that looked fantastic. All these years, I had never heard that one. What? Or think of coming up. Or think of coming up with that. <laughs> Tell a boring story. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Cool. Next. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next question. <laughs> Okay, still trying to make progress. Okay, still trying to make progress. External work mm -hmm. stress just turns up the anxiety and I just head from my bed. But I can refocus, I can get close to feeling normal. Can dare still sort things for me? That's the end of the question, but it went it ended with dot dot dot. Um so I don't know if um, I missed something here, but just yeah, I just need to reread that. Um still trying to make progress, external work stress. I guess I stresses at work, turn up the anxiety, and then I head from my bed and I refocus and I can get close to feeling normal. 
Will Dare still sort things for me? Um, yes, but that's not what Dare is for. It's got to be working backwards, yes. right? Work stress is happening, which cranks the anxiety. And in response to the anxiety, I retreat to bed to try and feel better. And when I feel better, then I can go back to work. Opposite. It's, wow, work stress is happening. Here comes my anxious response. But now here, here's the crossword roads. Here's the choose your own adventure, right? Here is a, now when I'm anxious, do I uh, flee? Uh, going to bed is a version of flee, right? I'm retreating to bed to try and calm down, to try and wait for anxiety to calm down. Then I can get back into work. And so that's not, that's not dare. Dare is learning how, like, allowing the feeling of anxiety, but you're also in charge of your decisions and behaviors, right? And you kind of start calling it out yourself out on that. Like, I don't need to lay down and feel anxious. I can absolutely sit up and feel anxious. I can feel anxious like this. Or else can I bring this feeling with me? I can bring this feeling with me to work. And it's how to make peace with that feeling. Not I can, I'm only okay when I feel better, which is usually a very common thread in a lot of these the, the mm -hmm. questions that come in. Yeah, I think it, the question is a little bit difficult to answer because I don't fully understand it. So I'm assuming something. Um, and I'm just going to assume something different than you, Michelle, for a moment. Um, could he maybe mean that uh, he's just tired because he's so stressed and he just he's not going out on a drive maybe to, you know, overcome his driving anxiety or or whatnot? Because it seems like from how the question is worded, that he feels that he should be more active in could dealing be. with his anxiety. If maybe you're I'm, on I'm here, just... if you want to pop up and, and clarify, but yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Right. But what Michelle said, and just in case you meant like you just need a break from stress in order to refocus on anxiety recovery. Um, I get what you mean. And yes, sometimes absolutely. When we go through anxiety, that is stressful. Recovery is stressful. And when life stresses come on top, yes, of course, we will need kind of like more breaks or more self-care. That's that's very normal. But still, you can stress is stress. It's it's a feeling. Take time out for yourself to recover. But at the same time, um, anxiety recovery should not be that active. You know, like Michelle said, it's more the response to what you're feeling rather than becoming active in, you know, overcoming it mm -hmm. you're not overcoming it by jumping over it like it's a hurdle <laughs> right you are more it's more getting out of the way of stuff right so you're going about your day or imagine you're picturing yourself you're walking on a path okay and you're heading a certain direction and while you walk there anxiety will pop up from the side and get in the way and now it's not about, oh, let me get out my tools, my arsenal of things that I have learned so I can fight you away and keep walking. No, it's just like you walk around it. <laughs> or, like, walk it. Okay, or walk through it. Or, or walk like, through it. Or like acknowledge it. Yeah. This has yeah. been my conversation at least the past week, if not two weeks. That exact, it's hard to put that into words because that's what it's like attitude and mindset. And even recently on some of my posts the past week on Instagram, a lot of comments of like, but how? So do I stop? And then I look at the thing and I say, I accept you. And do I, and and I think that's where I think the majority of the frustration comes in for, for most people. And it's because there's like, there's mechanical, this came up on the group call too on Dare Advance. There's mechanical approach to things and there's automatic approach to things. And what happens, especially if anxiety is new to you or it sort of popped up, we basically live life automatic mode where you're just sort of going through life right stuff's happening but you're not paying very close attention to it and then that light bulb gets brighter and now we notice all this stuff and now we're in mechanical mode and we're using dare like going through the steps mechanically to like try and if i pluck these strings just right i learn the guitar but you stay in mechanical mode and it's like you accept and allow the majority of your life, but you're not working hard at doing it. And that's why you're not aware of how it's done because you're not prefrontal cortexing it. You're just 
doing it. Like, and I, and I get his background. It was the same thing from the last one. She has a little plant behind her. She has a lamp, which I'm sure all of you noticed when the call started. But how long did you think you saw that lamp for? You probably saw it, but you didn't, you weren't aware that you saw it because you weren't trying to not see it. And when you try and not see something, it, it, you kind of get in the way of your body's own natural way that this works. This works naturally, right? Anxiety goes away naturally. You calm down indirectly and it doesn't require a lot of work. And I think that's where the frustration comes in because people are either trying hard or trying hard to not try hard. And yeah, yeah, both yeah. are trying, both are still doing. It's yeah. hard to explain yeah. that one. It's hard. It's really hard, guys. Um, but you see, I think if I, if I had to sum it up, like in one word or two words, it's, and I don't know if, if that's even a word or if I'm just making it up, but it's, you meet anxiety, you acknowledge anxiety in a non-reactive way, right? So it's not about not acknowledging. You can not help but notice it, okay? You can't. When when you have a panic attack or you have an intrusive thought, you cannot not notice it. So you acknowledge it's there. But now how do you acknowledge it? <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Or are you, I, yeah, you're here. I'm seeing you, looking at you, but I'm not reacting, I'm not reacting to that. It's, and again, super weird um, analogy, but uh, anger tantrums of children in the supermarket. Mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. do, what do they do? You can't help but notice them. And you're very angry and you want to do things to them that I don't want to, you know, say out loud here. But what do you do? You're like, okay, we're going to go home now. You grab the kid, you go home. When you're home, do you already feel super calm? Are you super fine? No, you're still angry. But have you noticed that after a while it regulates itself, the anger comes down? Yes. And it's the same with anxiety too. You have all these feelings, you have all the impulses, the urges to do something, but your reaction is one of composure and calm, non-reaction. And then you just allow it to be, and then it regulates itself. Right. Same with no with expectation, with no expectation, because that's exactly, somebody yeah. just posted that right there in the chat. Gal, calling you out. Then I get mad slash frustrated because the sensations just don't stop when I do dare. I think I'm a tad impatient. Mm. Ex that mm. is exactly where everybody gets stuck because you don't do dare with an expectation or stipulation. Just like Aida was saying, you don't accept and allow the temper tantrum to see if it works, to see if the kid turned it off. This is like, that's not, <laughs> this is not a pseudo sense of control. Wait, wait, this wait, wait, wait. That's perfect. Repeat that again. That's so good. That's an analogy that people can, you know, it makes sense. It's a great analogy. Repeat that again. And I'm going to write it down. Repeat that again. I don't know what I just said. Yeah, you, oh, don't you, don't, you don't accept and allow a temper tantrum to check to see if it worked. Like you just accept and allow that it is. You accept what is, period. Without to, to check to see is great, is it gone? That's still you using, then don't, then you're using dare as a weapon. That's you using a screwdriver for a hammer. And you're like, oh my God, this is the best tool I got. This They say this is the best tool. Yeah, for screws, not for nails. It's the It's great to teach you how to just be with what's already there be with what there with this mindset acceptance really is with the mindset like picture like a preschool classroom and if you're like fostering this idea of acceptance it's usually with this this line of all are welcome mm. all are welcome doors are open all are welcome that's what we're trying to foster here and we tend to not be welcoming to the parts of our human condition that are highly unpleasant or uncomfortable. And it's just your non-welcoming doesn't not let them in. Your non-welcoming only marks them as danger. And so all are welcome. That's really the, the, the essence of our job and most therapists' jobs, right? Like sad is welcome here. Yeah, and welcome. Scared is welcome. And we're trying to help you with the open part. We don't really care what's on the other side of that door. You know, Michelle, and I'm sure you've experienced that too. Every new client that comes to see me who 
doesn't know their well yet, at some point they will ask me, aha, so ah, if I don't react and, and if I accept the anxiety, then it will go away. I see. And I'm like, no, it won't. Like, I will, oh, oh, well, what do you mean? but not like that. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I'll, I'll feel instant relief. No. What you will feel is th- that relief of not fighting anymore, right? Mm-hmm. You're putting your foot off the gas and that feels relieving. But the anxiety will be there. Will yeah. be still there. It's not an off switch. Like, it's not, there's no off button. And for, there's an on button. Right. But there's, no, there's no off button. The same way you fall asleep. If you're going at it with steps to, steps to make sleep, you don't make sleep. Well, they say just lay down and close your eyes. Like if you had explained to like an alien who came here from another world how to go to sleep. Oh, this is how we sleep. We lay down and we close our eyes and we like don't really think about anything. And then we sleep and the aliens are going to be like, okay, check, lay down, check, check as if I check all the boxes and I've made sleep. No, you've succeeded in staying awake. Because you don't, love you don't alien. do yourself to sleep. <laughs> yeah, let's just say like, oh, I love it. I somebody love needs it. to, you don't teach yourself how to sleep. Your body sleeps, your body, like your body calms down. It's the same way we, I've been using this little inappropriate example too. It's the same way we, we pee, right? You don't try to pee. You basically spend your day trying not to pee, right? But when it's time to pee, like somebody write in the chat, if I didn't know how to pee, right? If I'm an alien, I don't know how to pee. Once you get through the mechanics of getting ready for pee, what do you actually do? What do you do to pee? You I'm like, potty training my son and this is so real. <laughs> there you go, Steph. <laughs> you do nothing. You, re- you just let go, buddy. Exactly. Go, and buddy. <laughs> you're trying to let go. If you're trying to pee. You just release. See, like nobody's yeah. going through the steps of pee and the steps of dare. And can I use dare for pee? You all, if you guys already know how to pee and if you've fallen asleep before, you already know how to do this. We just sort of get in our our own way of the natural things our body does without our involvement. So we're trying to like stay involved until it gets better, but really it gets better when we get as involved as little as possible, uninvolved from all of this. Yes. And also guys, be patient with yourself because it's really a learning process, right? It's this, there's so much relearning that needs to be done when, when you go through anxiety recovery and in the beginning, it is mechanical. It's like learning to tie your shoelaces. You have no idea how to do mm-hmm. that. And you feel like a robot and then you fail. And then you go through the steps like, oh, this is step one. This is step two. This is step three. And at some point, you just practice and practice and practice. And it's an automated reaction. It's the same with, with the dare. right? In the beginning, you're like, oh, I, I feel weird. Why do I feel weird? Oh, I just had this horrible thought. Was it an anxious thought or an intrusive thought? Oh, I think that's that was an intrusive thought. So how do I deal with intrusive thoughts? Oh, right. I just, um, oh, I don't demand more with intrusive thoughts. I just accept them. Okay, I accept you. I accept you. I accept you. And, and now I allow you. And, you know, with time and practice, what will happen? You're like, whoosh, whoosh. Yeah. Oh, oh, you learn how to tie your shoes. It happens. But you're not yes. looking. You don't remember the day you learned how to tie your shoes because it became no. automatic. And you don't remember that day because it was a different part of your brain that started doing it because you backed the hell off and you let it. Like I was just talking, use this exact example, but the, my client yesterday said skiing instead. And if you don't ski often enough, you have to, oh yeah, that's right. You go this way and this way. But by the end of the day or end of the weekend, oh, that's right. You're skiing again you don't ski with your head you don't learn how to tie your shoes with your head you don't like you start off with your head and then you end with your body like we're here to get it from your head and have your have it sink from your head to your body and it's a a less is more process yes and we we are using words and analogies and it's a mental idea construct we can't do more you are the one who gets to experience it and when you experience it 
the theory makes so much more sense. Mm -hmm. Then there's the, the those aha moments come up. Oh, now I get it. Right. That's why it's important to learn theory first and that it's mechanical first. That's okay. If you find yourself in that place right now, we have all been there and there is mm -hmm. nobody who can like hear the story and say, oh, that makes sense. And now I am embodying acceptance. I promise no one. Okay. <laughs> All right, next question. All right. Who goes me? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, sudden, suddenly, you see it? Suddenly I, have a new, suddenly I have a new OCD fear of losing my mind, specifically schizophrenia. Struggling to, get out of, struggling to get out of my head as I have been suffering from derealization for a while, which I think makes this all worse. But some days I feel sick all day and want to crawl into a ball as everything scares me due to this fear of going crazy. Super yeah. common so, question. Yeah, very, very, very common, very common. And, you know, the thing um, that is bothering you so much is, is not the content of this particular intrusive thought, but the uncertainty. Right? This is how you overcame all your other intrusive thoughts by allowing yourself to not know. Do not be certain, do not know for sure if this is true, if this is going to happen, if you ran somebody over, if you're going to lose your mind and stab someone or whatever the content of those intrusive thoughts is. At some point, you just stopped to react with compulsions and you just let them be and moved on. And now you're just stuck in that loop again where you just can't do that. Not yet. And this is why you experience so much anxiety. It's the same story with all the other ones you have experienced so far. It's the uncertainty the not not knowing for sure that this is not going to happen to you that keeps you stuck and keeps you in this control mode and also wait and see mode when is it going to happen when is it going to happen mm -hmm. has uh, something already changed is my voice different how are my thought process have they slowed down is it faster do i look different in the mirror and so on and so on you know how these thoughts go the the pattern is the same thing and i can't stress this enough with anxiety sensations are just like branches and, and leaves of a tree but the stem is the core fear the core fear is always the pattern the pattern the pattern the pattern as i just explained earlier there is something that I, that I don't like a trigger worst case scenario hook to that my body sends me energy so i can avoid or control and now i have the choice do i say yes okay let's go and control ruminate introspect avoid safety assurance behaviors whatnot or i say mm, no, I'm not going to do that because my experience tells me that this, this is just going to get worse. It's not helpful. What can I do? All right, there's an alternative to this. And this is acceptance and engaging in my life. Because I know deep down in my heart, I've been here before. I know what this is. I know this is anxiety and I move on. It's really, I know it sounds like so basic and so simple because I know how big the struggle can be when you're in it that's all there is to it yeah you're not fighting an actual problem you're fighting the idea of what if there's a problem and your pre-fight doesn't prevent problems your pre-fight no. gives you anxiety right yeah. right now energy right now fight right now danger they all need to be in the same screen the same present okay well where we get stuck is right now energy oh my god here's a whoosh of fear so you can fight oh the idea of schizophrenia i don't want to get schizophrenia so let's fight all the preconceived notions i have of what schizophrenia looks like what i think schizophrenia means which means i'm going to fight here comes dpdr because here's this, the, the fun the fun cousin that shows up of like oh well people people with schizophrenia how they are detached from reality. I feel detached from reality. That reminds me of <laughs> schizophrenia. Well, there's a thought yes. I don't like. I lost track of my memory. I love that reminds me of schizophrenia. And we take all these bits and pieces of things that reminds us of the worst case story. And we fight those things to prevent the worst case story. But since the worst case story doesn't exist, you're only fighting stories, thinking trying not to go crazy because if i fight crazy i'll somehow prevent crazy and it does not work like that fighting the idea of crazy creates anxiety 
And so the harder you fight, the not saner you stay, the more anxiety you create, because now you have a buildup with energy and there's no good outlet to plug it into. There's no tree falling <laughs> on you right now. There's no energy flow to the correct place. It's just sort of building up and building up and building up. And we think, oh my gosh, well, I can't just let go. If I, me hanging on is the only thing that's keeping me sane. Me hanging on, fighting through my heart palpitation is somehow mentally preventing a heart attack. It's not. It's just these safety. We tell these danger stories and then we tell these false reassurance safety stories to try and get rid of the danger story. And it just keeps us locked. And so and you see, guys, what Michelle just said, this applies to everything. It was yeah. the perfect summary, the perfect description. That is exactly it. Exchange, go crazy with, did I run someone over the traffic lights? Right? Uh, will I ever, ever get over this anxiety? Or will I, you know, forevering, we call it forevering. Will I always and always stay in my agony? It's the same thing. And by the way, Michelle, there is uh, somebody on the chat. Hi, Crystal Morgan. She explained it just far better than we can or did. You're afraid because your mind is in the future where the event hasn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. Bring, uh, oh, sorry, I lost the line. Uh, ah, you created that fear that isn't even real. Bring your mind back to the present moment and just breathe. 100%. Yes. 100 exactly. percent you're in a story thank you you're in a story yes 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 end of story right and you now the anxiety is already built up right? that's the problem because now it everything feels so real those thoughts feel so real the possibility of developing schizophrenia feels so real because your body feels out of control because it's it's filled with that nervous energy this is what, what you just have to sit out it's going to calm itself down. Like right? all the examples that we used, you know, of situations where we feel ramped up, but then it calms itself down. It will in this, in this case too, when you stop adding fuel to the fire, when you stop staying crawled up in bed, right? Fearing the moment when, you know, it's going to start, when the moment will come that you will lose your mind. Okay. Get out of bed. <laughs> And move on with your life. And as you do so, you will find it. You will find that you can let go of these thoughts more and more. Not today and not tomorrow. It takes time and practice. But um, that, that's really the only way, the only way through. And the alternative is not better. <laughs> All right. Next question. Oh, we're going good, Michelle. We're going strong today. I just can't seem to open. Oh, there you go. It, it opened back up. You got it? I can read it. I I printed them out because I can never read them on my Oh, computer. perfect. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I am terrified at the thought of being on my own at night and have been since a child. I have always been able to avoid this, but I would love to be able to go away just on my own for a few days or longer in a hotel or B&B. I'm okay as long as there is someone else in the house who I know with doors unlocked. Or if I'm in someone else's house, where doors are not locked, but not separate rooms in a hotel where doors are locked, all these conditions and stipulations we put up. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. and so this is um, being home alone, which is a pretty common thing, being home alone. Sometimes it starts from being a child. Sometimes it starts from trauma as a child. Um, for whatever reason, that becomes your alarm condition response of home alone is danger. Anybody else on the chat um, also have a hard time being home alone? Or if I am, there's many stipulations and or else attached to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't. Oh, was it? Oh, know? sorry, Michelle. Was it direct? <laughs> I was waiting. For I mean, you. I can. Oh, I can talk for nineteen hours, but I don't think anybody wants to hear that. You know, the the very simple answer to this: um, the only way out of this is to practice what you're feeling. Really, end of story. All, you know, the, these things that, that um, the stories and you know, the stipulations that Michelle just mentioned, th those are really not important at all. I can only do this when, I can only do so if. This is just a safety behavior, nothing. It's like somebody who doesn't go out without their phones or without their Xanax or without, without their bottle of alcohol. It doesn't matter. You think that, oh, because the door is locked or unlocked or because there's somebody there who I know or don't know, this makes me feel less uncomfortable that amount of discomfort is easier to handle than that amount of discomfort. But in both cases, it's about handling discomfort. 
it's it's the same with all other anxiety situations or you know sensations same thing there's something i don't like it triggers anxiety i don't like to feel anxious this is why i avoid or try to alleviate the anxiety i feel by you know doing all these things where do i want to go what is my goal oh i want to go out alone i need to be in a hotel room because this is what all people do and the door should be locked <laughs> In the hotel room. Yeah. It's a good thing if the door is locked. For right, so safety, I, right? Yes. Not for anxiety, right? You lock the door because it's practical to lock the door. And if you're home alone, it makes sense to lock the door for robbers, for murder. Yeah, not for anxiety. But yeah. not for fear, right? We can, This is where fear and danger gets smushed together. I can't be home mm -hmm. alone. Why? Because I'm scared. And that's when I come. we come in and we're like, but it's safe to be scared. Yeah. It's you're scared of being scared while you're home alone. And so your job yeah. is to get better at feeling the feeling of fear while you are home alone, while the door is either locked or unlocked or open or not, whatever we, you created in your head that, okay, as long as I set up life, the, the world around me, just perfect, then I'm okay. Lock the door for robbers. Don't lock the door to alleviate your anxiety. Anxiety sh shows up to, so that you can use it if there are robbers, but you don't have to know, you no longer have to make accommodations for fear and anxiety. It's the accommodations we make for it. I would love to go out, but I get scared. Okay. You're, so that means you're going to go out with scared and it's not just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. It's how you're doing it. Going out like, Stay home alone, but not survive. This is like what we were talking about like 20 minutes ago, how I treat that feeling that shows up, how to be scared, how to welcome scared, allow scared, thank scared for showing up, but also act safe, fearless, act safe. I can be safe and scared and kind of carry on what you would be doing if you weren't scared. Because you stop life for danger. You don't stop life for fear. Whether it's staying. And the next question, just to tie it into that one, agoraphobia and anxiety. It's the opposite. Going out and feeling scared. Staying in and feeling scared. Going out and feeling scared. It sounds like two different things. It's the same thing. I've determined certain situations are okay to have this feeling and certain situations are not. And it's... I can always have this feeling because it's safe to have this feeling. So yes, these questions are just to put that into context. And you know, yesterday on, our, on my day advance call, we did a little exercise turning um, the word but into the word and. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a brief example, because you know, a lot of this and all of these questions are not so much about being scared itself. It's about willingness to be scared okay mm -hmm. and to give you an example um i would like to fly with my family overseas but i can't do that because i would just you know i would go crazy on that plane because i'd be so anxious i would love to call my brother but we will get into another stupid argument and then it's just going to make me feel upset so i'm not going to call him so what this really translates into is i really want to go out with my family or fly with my family overseas but I will feel anxious and I'm not willing to feel anxious. Mm -hmm. I would like to call my brother, but I will get upset and I'm not willing to feel upset. I'm not willing. And it's important to notice that a but in these situations is a choice, whereas a, a but that refers to a real obstacle, I would like to buy a yacht, but I'm not a millionaire. It <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> doesn't work. A real life obstacle. But here it's about try, uh, avoiding emotional states. And this is a choice and that is okay. It's okay not to be willing. It's okay not to be willing yet. But it's important to notice that it's a choice. Right? And, and what it really translates into or how you could reframe this. Let's start there. I could say, I would love to go with my family on vacation, fly overseas, and I will feel very anxious. But... I'm going to do it because it's going to bring our family closer together. I'm going to call my brother and I will feel upset and sad and frustrated, but we will have made a further step in rebuilding our relationships. Right? 
where uh, Michelle, didn't you have a daily dare where you place your butt? Yeah, it was it was a little bit different for the butt. But it was um usually okay. we put our feelings for usually we put the accomplishment first. This is the trap that I just noticed people get stuck in. We put the the action first, and then we stick in the butt, and then we mm-hmm. add how we felt <laughs> afterwards. And whatever comes after your butt is usually where the light shines. B U T guys, B U T. Okay. And so the light, like usually what's before your butt is for context. And what comes after the butt is where the importance is. And we tend to have a flip flop version of stories. I mean, yeah, I mean, I took that vacation. I haven't left my house in 19 years and I took the vacation and I cured cancer and I created peace in the world. But, oh my God, it felt so bad. And it felt like my brain was crumbling to bits. And then, and then here comes the detailed story of the feel, as opposed to tell the same thing, just switch the order. Oh my gosh, Michelle, I give the, the facts first. I took a vac- I took a vacation, haven't been on a trip in 19 years. Wow, was that scary. That was really uncomfortable. I thought I was going to panic the whole time. I felt like my brain was crumbling to bits. But... And I yeah. went on freaking vacation. I did it. And then the, then the importance is on the action, which is the one thing you have a say in. You don't have a say in that random feeling that pops up. You don't get to decide how you feel, but you definitely chose to take the trip and you took the trip. And so that gets the confetti. Good job to your end. So like notice, notice what you're sticking before and after your butt and allow it all put the feelings first at least put the feelings first and that's how that's where the end would tie in yeah i'm really scared and i'm going on the trip or i can be really scared while i took that trip and that scared is just the noticeable thing that your body did while i was doing the thing i chose to do right noticeable and actionable yeah so what I said is like before you go and what you said is how you tell the story after you went right so I can say oh I'm going to call my brother and I am going to be upset right Right? but it's important to me and after the call you can say what Michelle oh well I called my brother and I was right I was really upset but but I called him because calling him was the, I was calling him. If, if, if I knew I wasn't going to be upset, if the feeling piece wasn't in there, I would have called him. That's the value. That's the reason why I was doing the thing. So I'm calling him. Yeah, I did feel upset. And we also left and we also did this, but I called him. The task was the call. The task is not the feeling. Yes. Oh, I love this. This is so good because it really it summarizes it, right? normalization of anxiety understand what is going on notice the pattern of anxiety and the pattern of your reactions okay get really well get to know yourself really well get to know anxiety really well and then work on these two things it's willingness it's being clear on your values knowing why you are you are putting yourself through discomfort for what because you could you could as well choose not to do it but you but it's painful to stay where you are. So connect with why you're doing that. Right? And tell a boring story. <laughs> and always remember, you don't I accept take notes on you, our own words. You, you don't accept yours. I take notes on yours. You don't accept the anger tantrum and check if it's gone yet. <laughs> I love this. This is brilliant. So I think that was a great wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for great questions today. I hope you um, all got something out of it. And even if we don't answer your question, I think in some form we did. At least we hope so. And we do see you next time. More questions. Thank you, Michelle. Bye, everyone. We'll see you see on the next care. call. Take bye, care. Bye. bye. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.